I wanted to thank you and welcome you to coming to increase student engagement in your FYE course. Uh, thanks for coming. And just so you know in advance, a little bit of housekeeping, this webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to see it where you logged in. Um, we'll also be sending out an email as well to follow up after. And we'll, you should receive that uh, by tomorrow with the latest. And if you have questions in the meantime and throughout the presentation, please just enter them in the chat window and uh, I will try and ask them to Nick as soon as they come up or there's going to be a Q&A session at the end. So a little bit of housekeeping again. This webinar is brought to you by Human Esources. Human Esources is a worldwide leader in the development and provision of online personal assessments, student success and education and career development programs. We've also just launched a free resume service. You can learn more at humanesources.com. And we're very fortunate today to have our own Nick Ravinovich uh, here to talk to you about course-based engagement for greater student persistence and a reduced workload for you. Nick oversees the educational content of our products and the resources that support those products. He works closely with educational research consultants and performs his own research to continuously improve our current suite of products. Nick has worked in the online education and career development field for 19 years. Prior to that, he spent seven years as a high school teacher covering several subject areas, including biology, physics, math, and psychology. Nick has a Bachelor of Science degree in Biological Sciences and Psychology and a Bachelor of Education in Secondary Science. So I'd like to welcome Nick to today's call and I'm gonna pass the mic over to him. Thanks, Tamara. Appreciate that. Uh, I know Tamara said that uh, apparently we're all fortunate I'm here, but I'm also fortunate that you all are here. Um, I am a, a lifelong educator. I know I, I got out of the formal uh, education world of, of teaching uh, some time ago, but um, I consider myself a lifelong educator. Uh, something that wasn't in my bio, but I do want to share is that I'm also a nationally certified swim coach. I do train other coaches and volunteer coach. And um, when I moved into the private sector from teaching, I moved into sort of corporate training and developing training programs and other trainers. Bottom line is you can, you can see the pattern there th throughout my life. Um, I'm basically passionate about how humans pass on knowledge and skill to other humans. And I, I honestly believe it is the way we can make the world a better place. And, and I'm, I'm happy that you all are kind of part of that team of, of educators who do the same sort of thing and hope that you believe that you know, you're making a difference um, for the positive, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now. There's a lot of negative things to see, but um, it's sometimes it's important to, to focus on the positive too. And, and that's, I wanted to give that introduction to, to know my motivation, because I feel if as an educator, you pass on that motivation to your learners in whatever form that is, they're going to increase that engagement. So that's my first little tip about increasing engagement is, you know, let the, let the learners know where you're coming from and, and why you do it. Uh, because once they believe that, they're much more likely to be engaged in, in whatever you're, you're trying to pass on. So um, I just wanted to get that out of the way. And the next you slide, already, actually. Sorry, I was just going to chime in quickly. You already have somebody else who's a biology and, and psychology background. So nice. Nice. <laughs> We don't we don't see that very often. So yeah, it was it was a really interesting transition to go from a science base. I even worked in a medical lab for a while, um, and and turn that into what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, no thanks for thanks for coming out. Um, another great way to start, in top of an int introducing yourself, is to do an icebreaker. And there's a slight difference between introducing yourself and having an icebreaker. Icebreaker is more for the the learners to introduce themselves. But there's a specific way you can do this that makes them more comfortable and gets things off to a great start. Um, and so we're going to do an icebreaker right here and now. And uh, in the chat, since there's enough of you that if we were to do this verbally, it might take a little bit too long. We're, we're condensed for time. But you know, in, in your role, if you can do it verbally where people are face to face, that, that is more ideal. So just in the chat. Um, put your name in and uh, something unusual or interesting about your institution or organization. And uh, we can all look at it and that kind of breaks the ice between us, not just me as the presenter. Um, 
and my my fact to go first is that uh, we've been a virtual company at Human Resources here since 1997, way before it was cool. So it's a little proud fact that we have that uh, we've been a virtual company long before COVID ever set foot on uh, on this planet. So I'll give a little bit of time for people to put that in the chat. And if you're, Tamara, if you want to remind people where the chat is in case they, they don't see it. I think I'm looking at the chat. I'm not seeing anything yet. So I know Dana knows about it. I, I assume I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Dana. <laughs> Physician assistant, I, it's a very important, I think, position. I know training enough doctors to satisfy uh, the amount of healthcare that we need to provide is, is difficult. So I think physicians assistants are going to play a huge role in, in helping out with that. So that's awesome that your institution does that. Doesn't have a mascot. Interesting. Well, there's an opening for you, Andrea. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's interesting, the male and female mascot. I went to a university that had uh, male and female mascots, and that ended up being a point of contention at some point, which I understand. Uh, and, and there was, even within the female community, there was discussions about whether that was uh, seen as, you know, a negative or a positive. Uh, but, yeah, there's not many. I know uh, uh, McGill University in Montreal, the same thing. They have a, a male and female. Rouge et all, if you know you're French. All right, that, that's good. So I'm going to continue on, even though I know some people haven't contributed, and that's fine. Uh, the reason I did a question that's not overly personal, is a question about your institution rather than about you yourself, is very often people may not be as willing to share something about themselves in the beginning. So it's important that your icebreaker be not super personal and that it be but something that's unique and memorable like the the two mascot thing the uh, training physicians assistants um those are all unique things which are neat to remember and it and becomes a fact that somebody can start a conversation with so now the peers are much more likely to discuss with each other and becomes a point of conversation for you to have with your students to kind of open things up um so that you know having a, an icebreaker that uses that sort of approach is is more ideal also, nice and short is what you do, especially if you have a very large classroom. You can, of course, do this online just like we did, or you can do this in person. Many of the things that we're going to discuss today are uh, able to be done in both types of environments, in, in person and online. Um, but we are going to focus a little bit more on the online stuff, just, just to give you a warning. But you're going to see why fairly soon. So uh, let me just move on to the next slide here. Actually, before before I move on, I meant to ask, is anyone here? And you know what? There probably are small enough crowd here that if someone wants to take themselves off of mute or off of, uh, put their camera on, feel free to do so. There's, we have no rule against it right now. But if you want to take yourself off mute and offer an idea that you have done in the past as an icebreaker that has worked well, or if you have an idea for an icebreaker that has failed spectacularly and, and you advise other people not to do it, uh, please share. Um, I'm trying to make this as interactive as possible. We want to engage people here in the webinar, not only uh, in our institutions, but here in the webinar as well. So if you have an idea, feel free to take yourself off mute. And you know what? I'm probably going to move forward anyway, so feel free to interrupt. I don't mind being interrupted at all. Uh, if, if you want to interrupt me at any point during this presentation, please feel free to do so. Um, and if you put it in the chat, Tamara will uh, tell me that somebody wants to say something. So. I just want to open that up. So you can type it in the chat if you feel more comfortable that way, but feel free to take yourself off mute and share any icebreaker idea that has worked or has not worked. Okay. Huh. That's an interesting fact too. Okay. 
So this is our overall agenda today. Um, it's fairly straightforward, and this is something um, I would advocate for mirroring when you are dealing with students too, is when you do your agendas for the day or even for the overall course or program, whatever you're offering at your school, that you make it written in plain English, not in you know fancy jargon that is specific to your area of study. Uh, this is going to make students feel a lot more comfortable. So that's the way I've written it. Of what does learner engagement look like? How do you measure or track it? How can you optimize it? And I've used the optimize word intentionally there because maximizing it can take too much effort on your part as an educator. Um, and it also has diminishing returns over time. So optimize is kind of get that sweet spot uh, that, that we all try to achieve. And then what are some tools that can help with, with learner engagement? Now I'm going to bring up the first poll here just to learn more about your role at your institution. So that should be popping up for you. And I'll show the results to everyone once people have answered. So please input your primary job role. Oh, quite a few others. Interesting. If you answered other, um, please put your role, your primary job role in the chat. Um, we'd love to know more about what that is. Um, I, what, to be honest, I wasn't expecting quite as many, but uh, I'll show the results to everyone just to, so you can see what that looks like. So if you answered other, um, please in the chat indicate what your job role is so that we can cater this webinar to those different roles. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now because I think most people have answered. I did see a point uh, of staying away from things when it comes to the icebreaker, staying away from things that put students on the spot as far as their memory. So something that they you know, automatically know and, and be able to share in order to reduce the amount of stress that they feel in that moment. Yeah, no, that, that, that is a good point. Um, it can do just first name or something else. But yeah, icebreakers can be tough. It does stress some people out. So, you know, you want to monitor that as, as best you can. Like I said, if you can do it in a, in a text chat like this, that tends to be a little less high stakes uh, in, a, in an online situation. So we have someone who's a program assistant for FYE, kind of program oversight and uh, also teaches, but is looking at the organization, uh, organizing of the program. Okay. That's one of the other. Right, so you may be almost a mentor of sorts for the instructors a little bit, if, if you can play that type of role. Um, because what, what we're gonna cover in this is, is pretty hands-on in terms of what can increase learner engagement. Um, so, you know, Either you're, you would be doing these things directly with students or you would be facilitating other uh, instructors who work with students or other educators who work with students on these engagement strategies. So um, there is some policy type things we'll be talking about, but admittedly, uh, the majority of it is going to be a little more hands on type uh, strategies. So just wanted to put that out there. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Um, what does learner engagement look like? So in order to increase engagement, you got to know what it looks like. Uh, and, that, and so that's this section that we're talking now is going to be all about what does learner engagement look like. And in order to understand what learner engagement looks like, you need to know what learners look like. Uh, so this is taken from uh, the Community College Survey of Student Engagement. And uh, this shows that online students especially, but also not online students, are a lot less traditional than what we may have seen in the past. So this is very important to note. Um, I know when I saw this, I was semi-surprised, but admittedly, uh, I've been out of the formal education game for a little bit of time. So maybe this has, doesn't come as much of a surprise to uh, the people here, but um, I thought it, it significantly impacts the way we can increase engagement or the importance of increasing engagement. So it's important facts to know that, uh, you know, Basically, to, to sum up what, what the point is here is that um, 
Current students today, post-secondary students, do not look like this. In fact, they look probably more like this. Um, there are a lot more distractions in our lives. We are more physically removed from the learning environment than we ever have been in the past, uh, especially post-pandemic. Um, but it, it's also just a factor of the modern day world. In fact, the, it, it'd be questionable about whether this person would be actually trying to do their coursework on their phone or the phone is a distraction. Some other emergency came up when they were trying to do their coursework on top of you know raising a family. So this is more like what the students of today look like uh, and this is why we have to take in mind when we are talking about engagement and why engagement is so important. All right. <clears throat> Anybody have any, any sort of comments or questions about that information about what current uh, students look like? And this is not just community colleges, too. I, the data I showed before was focused on community colleges, but when I compared it to um, the larger uh, college post-secondary uh, uh, statistics, it was not far off. So it's not unique to community colleges. Um, so I want people to take a guess now about what they think the, the percentage of students that take at least one course online. Since we, the last slide we looked at said, you know, online students are much more likely to be non-traditional versus online students, but, or non-online students, but the face-to-face -face students still have a significant amount of of non-traditional uh, factors related to them. Let's take a look at what percentage of students are taking online courses. So this is more like in the in the policy development side of things. Uh, but take a guess in the chat, how many, what percent of people do you think take at least one online course in as of the fall 2021? So this is semi post pandemic, most post-secondary institutions that opened a face-to-face uh, -face learning back up and we're doing it so it wasn't, you know, 100% impacted by COVID, but it, it you know may have been partially. And then I want you to take a guess at what percent took all online courses. And this is community college students. That's what the CC stands for, by the way, just in case. Anybody have any guesses? Okay, I'm about to flip back and forth to see the chat. Nothing at the moment, yeah. Okay. takes a bit to find the window and then type a response. Oh, really? That's that's too bad. Okay. I apologize <laughs> if you're going back and forth and it's cumbersome. Didn't realize that. Okay. Well, I'll just uh, I'll just move along anyway, just for the sake of keeping things moving. Um, basically, 65% took at least one course online. So that's two thirds. And then 40% took all online. So that's almost half of community college students are dealing online. And that, remember back to the non-traditional, that's a lot of non-traditional students you have out there and a lot of adjustment that needs to be made from the way we've done things in the past. So that speaks to why learner engagement is so important. I'm gonna throw up another quick poll now uh, because I do want to cater, we, we talked about um, polls being important where I mentioned that polls could be important with the information again, but it is important that you follow up with whatever you learn in the poll back to your learners. Otherwise, they're going to feel like the polling is pointless. Why did I do that if, if it doesn't change anything? So um, the, the information I gather through this poll, I want um, to pay attention to. So uh, I want you to answer this poll saying, of the FYA courses or program elements you teach or otherwise involved with, um, what percent are delivered online? So we're going to get a, uh, an idea of what your institutions do, are doing. Okay, so and you should be able to see the results come in live. And it looks like it's pretty in line with what we saw on that pr previous slide. So that's good to know that you know there's a lot of people delivering online courses uh, with regard to FYE. Okay. Although there is one that is all face-to-face, -face. it's good to know. So it is pretty varied. All right, good to know. Okay, so learner engagement and what it looks like. So we looked at the learners and what they look like. We realized they're non-traditional, that a significant portion are taking the, their FYE online. 
uh, in all community colleges online. In fact, we the poll was on FYE, but the data I showed you before was on all courses. So when it talks about when you talk about learner engagement, there's a certain depth you can go to, right? The base levels they just show up, they register, they may show up on the first day, and that might be all you see. Of course. The next level is they actually respond to re instructor prompts. So an instructor reaches out to them and they provide some kind of response. The next is complete work on time, complete work, all work earlier on time um, versus just a required work. They ask questions unprompted or add to discussions unprompted. And finally, you know, the, the holy grail of learning for I know a lot of educators is they provide relevant output beyond the program scope. So they are starting to make connections from what they're being taught in the course to other things that um, may be personal to them or even just not necessarily something that was delivered in the course, but is connected in some way. Um, and the whole point here is to try to nudge them slowly deeper and deeper into that engagement. So that's supposed to represent engagement. Now, trying to get them to jump you know, steps all the way can cause a negative reaction. So the research shows that if you just nudge them a little bit along, so, hey, you know, I saw you show up, but hey, can I just get a response from you? Next thing, you know, thanks for responding. Hey, this next assignment is due on this day. Um, is there anything I can help you with to make sure you hand it in on time, that one thing that's required? And then the next thing is that, oh, they're doing all the required things, but maybe they're not doing some of the supplementary stuff. And then you nudge them in that direction. So nudge them along the way deeper and deeper into that engagement. And, and that's just sort of an overall strategy. Um, so you can see here that I mentioned before that uh, we're talking about things that are a little more hands-on that are happening between an educator and the learner directly. Uh, and, and of course, set, maybe setting policy to educators who are dealing with students to do these same sort of things. What I'm not going to talk about today uh, is more things that are invisible to, to, the, to the institution, things like home life, family support, past experience. Now, of course, those things are important to engagement, but um, our ability to manage those or to assist with those is limited. Uh, if you have the ability to, great. Uh, unfortunately, this webinar is, is, is not here to address those things. It's more to address the things that the institution can deal with directly. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to cover that. Um, so one thing you may recognize here that the main areas of engagement are related to learner output, which sounds a lot like you know, their assignments, their coursework and things like that. And that's true. That's, it, I, I'm not trying to pull the wool over your eyes in, in that regard. Um, this is the easiest and best way. It also is the way that you're not doubling down on things. There are tools out there that, you know, um, purport to measure engagement in different ways that aren't related to assignments and things that the students would be responsible for. But that's really adding, the, the research showing that's adding to the load of the educator because now they're monitoring this, this, uh, learner engagement facet, and then on top of that, you're trying to handle all the assignments and the grading or or uh, following up with students on the things that they need to do for your FYE program, and that becomes a burden. So it's best to merge those things. Look at those things that are the output from the student and use that to measure engagement. And that's, that's really what the point of this slide is. Uh, and, and when you do measure that engagement, do it in, in a way that um, you can respond to nudge them in the right direction gradually. Um, now, I put these steps on here, but of course, this isn't comprehensive. So I'll pose the question out. And I, so far, I haven't been that successful, admittedly, with getting people to respond in the chat, but uh, I'll keep at it. Uh, is there anything you think I've missed from this slide in terms of ways to see what engagement is in, in terms of the learner output? Um, things that, are, that jump out of you going, oh, you missed this thing that can, uh, that's an, uh, an output from the student that would be an indicator of engagement. Please put that in the chat. Maybe there's, do you think there's a delay on people's responses? Because I'm seeing a lot of responses from the percent thing. I don't know. I was noticing that too, so I'm just flipping between a few different sections to see if it uh, reloads. So yeah, our apologies right. here for a little bit of a technical issue. If uh, you're putting in an answer and saying, what What are they talking about? Why are they not responding? 
Yeah. Um, so we have a really good suggestion um, from Monique, and and I, I'm going to say your names because I want to attribute it to you. I hope you're not too too uh, shy that you don't want your name mentioned. But uh, she mentioned that the suggestion on the, from the students on how they felt they enjoyed engagement. So sort of a polling on you know whether they enjoyed a certain activity or or certain something that was done for engagement. So understanding how the students are responding in, in a more direct way, and for sure that could be something in here to say, do you feel engaged? Just straightforward question to the, to the students. Uh, and, and that would be a you know very easy way to measure it for sure. Okay, uh, some more answers may come in, but I just wanna make sure I'm sensitive to people's time. Um, so another example that I was gonna say, I'm gonna say, ask the audience here where they think in this hierarchy it may go is that um, asking the learners if they are comfortable accessing the course material or the program material, as it were. I, I know not all FYE programs are delivered via courses. Some are, are programs that are aside from the course schedule. So how comfortable are you as the FYE learner in this case, uh, comfortable with accessing the program material, the schedules, whatever it is. Sometimes you know, they sign up and they don't even know where to go to get the thing. So something like that would be a pretty base level measure of engagement. Uh, and, and something like that could be sort of akin to the respond to instructor level of engagement where, you, you know, I got to make sure this person understands where to go in terms of completing or accessing this FYE program. Okay. So we looked at what does learner engagement look like and how can you track it? Uh, maybe a little bit better than you've been able to do it in, in the past. And this is more of a less of a tool to do it because I mentioned having additional tools that do something different is a burden. So this is going to be based on um, looking at the output of the student and looking at three major areas. And these are pretty straightforward. Is it on time? Is it of sufficient quantity? Are they connecting with their peers and with the instructor, handing things in on time? And is it good quality? Um, so this means if, you, if this is the way you're looking at learner output and it, by proxy engagement, you have to get that learner output early and often. So many times I've seen courses and, and um, FOA programs where some kind of output from the student is not expected until a month or even two weeks is too late. Uh, and it's very important to, to have that output expected early on and relatively often. And that means you need to break it up into smaller pieces. Obviously, burdening the student with a large thing to do in the first week of school uh, is not a good way to get engagement. Uh, so it has to be something small, setting out little test feeds to say, you know, did they respond to this email? Did they click a checkbox? Did they, you know, indicate that they read a, a single page handout type thing? So little things like that are great ways to start with learner engagement and then get deeper as you move on, kind of like that hierarchy uh, I showed before. So you have to get it early, you have to get it often, that output. So I'm going to show an example here in an LMS system uh, that, you know, we happen to work alongside with. We're not, this is Canvas, if anybody recognizes it. If you don't recognize it, that's fine too. Uh, very similar, similar to other LMS systems. Uh, but here, just in, in the first little while, you can see uh, within you know a couple of weeks, there are four little things expected from students, and with due dates on them, you know, a few days apart. Uh, in some cases, uh, I know the dates aren't exact; they're November 9th and 10th are reversed, so apologize for that. But uh, things are laid out in small little chunks, so that it's quickly can see is engagement working? Have they done this first thing? Have they done the second thing? But these are small things. A discussion: just post your goal for the course, for example. Um, attending the introduction, completing the introduction, which may have been an icebreaker or something else, uh, that type of thing. So it is it is important to have those things done often and early and, and due dates, of course. So this is, an LMS can do this, but you can do this with other tools as well. Any, any questions on this? And one question you may have is, well, you know, RFY program, there is no grade or series of points that they get. It's just an overall completion mark. 
and that and that's fine. What you can do is just have points within the course as you know a, a kind of a a incentive that's I know not very strong, but it's at least something that they can score throughout the program, uh, even though there's no grade associated with your FYA program. And it's just an indicator to the student of, you know, am I getting everything? Am I doing everything right? And people generally want to do things right. So having a little point system within those programs is fine. And that's what this can be, whether your, your FYE program is graded or not. Um, speaking of which, I have one another poll for you that is related to that. Takes me a second to bring it up. Is your FY program completely optional, required, but not for credit, etc.? And we'll okay. So you can see as to sell the completely optional ones, obviously. Those are going to be the most difficult to get that engagement. That's probably why you're looking for strategies for engagement, because if there's no accountability to it, uh, it's a lot harder to get buy-in, admittedly. Uh, if it's for credit and graded, that is ideal. So uh, the people who have it required for credit and graded, I'd like to introduce you to the people who are in the completely optional column. And if you have any advice, any advice that you manage to um, get with the dean or whatever powers that be in the institution who make those decisions uh, for making FYE programs accredited uh, and graded, please share that advice in the chat now because I'm sure they're looking for that advice. Uh, there are many different ways to do that. Um, that doesn't That's not part of the scope of this webinar, but definitely something that can help with engagement. So um, please share any advice that you have for that because that's that's extremely valuable. Um, and I don't want to dismiss the completely optional people too. There's things that in this webinar can definitely help you with engagement. Uh, but you know, you just have to sort of work around the fact that things are completely optional. I will put a quick link to a resource we have actually that uh, is a white paper on uh, related to that subject with some numbers yeah. and yeah. a calculator too that you can help see what what even money could that bring into your institution. So I'll yeah, leave that in just a quick minute. That's that's a good point um, Tamara's making is that often it's it's a money driven decision uh, about that. And uh, the resource Tamara mentioned talks exactly about that, how um, the investment into making an FYE program, accredited program um, can actually pay dividends through retention. Uh, and we do have that white paper that can help make make your case to the dean, uh, like I said, to whoever powers it be to, to help you in that direction, if, if, if that is what you desire, of course. Excuse me. Okay. So we talked about a little bit required versus optional. Um, and, you know, obviously that required programs make it a little bit easier uh, because it you know, contributes towards their graduation. So you can hang that little carrot over them to ensure they're doing it. But as, as I mentioned before, um, there are ways to engage even if it is um, optional. Uh, and, and remember, the nice part about FYE programs, um, if they are being evaluated, is that anything that they do in the program to connect with you or with others in the program, that whole collaboration thing, can be considered something that you evaluate as a learning outcome. Uh, FYA programs, the whole goal is for them to feel connected to the school, to be engaged with the school, which is what we're talking about here, engagement. If they're engaged with the course, um, they're more likely to be engaged with the school and vice versa. So anything that they do in that program can be considered part of the learning outcomes and therefore part of the, the grading rubric. So um, I just want to mention that when in those required type programs and optional programs, um, obviously not as much, but uh, just wanted to point that out. So how can you optimize uh, learner engagement? So now we're talking about the, some specific strategies that can be done. Most of these, like I said, are gonna be direct between um, educator and learners. But uh, of course, this also has to do with setting policies for instructors. If you manage uh, a series of instructors in an FYE program, things that you can um, 
advocate for it that they do. Um, so we talked a little bit about the icebreaker. This is just sort of a repeat of what um, I, uh, we did before as an example, um, but I wanted to include it in the slide just so when, if anyone went back and viewed the recording, um, they got a little more information on that. Um, and if, like I said before, introduce yourself and instructor, pro provide your motivations to people um, or tell your instructors to provide their motivations to the students to get that buy-in. Uh, if, if the student believes that the educator wants to be there, they're much more likely to want to be there as well. And that's critical. Students are very perceptive about those types of things. Any kind of instructor that feels like they're just phoning in, they're doing it because it's their job, that makes engagement a lot more difficult. Um, so there has to be that sort of belief in the program. Hearing some pings, I guess, Tamara, you'll let me know if it's something relevant to... So far, it's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry for okay. that. Um, I'll also provide this opportunity. We did the icebreaker early on. If anyone has had any ideas since, and this is another engagement tool that you can use. Um, someone even brought it up earlier that people may not feel comfortable in the beginning even sharing their name or, um, or speaking up at all. So now that we're partway in, I'll say, if anyone has any ideas that they thought of, and some people just need time to process things. Uh, so if anyone has any ideas now of an icebreaker or an introduction to the class um, that they didn't have the opportunity to say before, put that in the chat now, um, and we'll have a recording of it, of course, which is, is great for anyone who watches this later. So um, do that. But these are kind of the, the general advice in terms of having a, a, a start simple icebreaker. So we do have one comment um, related, you know, just saying, I do like to tell my students that community is not built by just being in a class together, that the instructor must be intentional for it to happen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Very well said. Um, I, I like that the way you've, you've phrased that. So yeah, you, you are building a community in classroom. I, I mean, I distinctly remember, even though I was in a, a science focused degree with my first degree, um, I took a, it's called a creative nonfiction writing class, which sounds a little bit strange, creative nonfiction, um, but I thought it might help me with science communication, basically, which was what I was looking at early on. And the instructor in that case really built the community. That was one of my favorite classes all through my post-secondary um, experience. And it was because of the community that she built in the classroom. Uh, it, it was it was pretty amazing. We gradually sort of revealed ourselves over our time through our writing, which was her intent at the start. Um, but I, I got so much out of that course as a result. So um, yeah, when you start things off and you can slowly chip away at those those walls where people are revealing themselves in safe ways, of course, you, you don't want people overly exposed. But um, she she created that very safe environment for that, and it ended up being a really impactful class as a result. So. And it started with her, of course. She, you know, was revealing of herself to some degree, you know, still in a professional, at a professional distance, but it was um, very well done and helped open up the class themselves. So uh, th thanks for sharing that information. Okay, more learning engagement techniques. So of course, surveys that have impact. So we mentioned that um, when you do a survey, the results of which should at least be shared with the crowd, like we were sharing our results with you. So you can see, hey, you know, where do I sit in terms of the survey of the class? Students are interested to see that. They want to say, you know, here's where I sit. Where are other people? I'm curious about that. They, they don't know. Uh, but also, if you can follow it up with discussion focused on that, address, you know, where people are. If you're finding out some students are, you know, working full time in addition to course and, and a significant number are, you may need to adjust the way you're delivering the program to accommodate. And, and if they see that adjustment, they see that you've responded to that survey, they're gonna get that engagement because they realize, you know, I'm being listened to here. If, if people feel listened to, they are more engaged. Um, so that that's key in, in the survey. And regular contact from faculty. I know this, this is the one part that I will admit, this doesn't make your job any easier. Some of these engagement jobs or engagement techniques will make your job easier, but having that regular contact from you as faculty uh, will get the students to buy in. It, what that basically means is setting up your course in, in advance and it's you know pretty airtight before the first day of, of school. 
uh, or setting up your, your program so that it's pretty airtight before the first day. So it's not something that's being built in the air. Um, that should allow you for that time to regularly contact students um, and get that engagement. If, if, if teachers are sitting back, not contacting students and just leaving it up to the content of the course to do, to do the bulk of the work, that's just not going to work. It, it, there has to be that regular contact. Um, and promoting peer interaction. So contact can be with faculty, but also with peers. Uh, discussion forums, things like that, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. And okay to fail opportunities. This is one of my favorite things. Uh, I remember doing professional development and setting up an environment where it's okay to fail in terms of you know meeting the learning outcomes what, when I'm talking about that and doing assignments, doing things. If you have set up an environment, it's okay to fail. There's going to be much more engagement. They feel safe. They're not going to hold back. And what I mean by okay to fail opportunities, I mean where they can try things out that are not high stakes, that are not for a grade, that are not you know um, going to cause them to not complete the the FYE program requirements, but something where they can test what they've learned so far from the program and see if they're doing it right, uh, and then set them up for when it actually is a high stakes situation when it is for oh if you do this right then you then you get the requirement they've had that experience in the past and they're going to be much more comfortable. So that okay to fail opportunities is critical for engagement. And of course, a clear view of progress. They have to know what they've seen and where they've been. We're going to detail these a little bit more coming up. So uh, I just wanted to introduce them here on this slide. And of course, there are more than just this, um, but these are the ones I wanted to focus on because uh, the research does show that these are ones that have some of the greatest impact in terms of, of learner engagement. There's a lot of, re it doesn't necessarily look like this, but there is a lot of research um, behind these uh, professed techniques. So if, if anyone has questions or wants to see that research, um, you can reach out to me and, and I'll send you the reams of information, which is some deep reading, but interesting reading nonetheless. Um, okay, so feedback, good practice. Uh, this one is that I really want to talk about. So it can be done through surveys, but of course, um, with follow up to assignments and great things. So one of the things you want to start off with, though, uh, is Students should have push notifications active. If you're not familiar with the term push notifications, it basically means that if you were to, uh, you know, respond to an assignment, post something in in the FYE program into the LMS or or whatever other system you use, that it sends it actively sends an email or a text, whatever method of communication the student has set up in the beginning with the school, it sends them that message. If they don't have push notifications active you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So push notifications is pretty critical for maintaining engagement because when updates happen, they get, you know, a message. And if they don't ever see that message, they're just not going to pay attention to it. They're only going to see things when they decide, oh, it's time for me to check out what's going on in the FYE program or my FYE course. So push notifications is critical. If you have an LMS, it makes it much, much easier. Most LMSs are set up to do exactly that. Uh, and try to vary the type of feedback. The little window you see in the bottom left of the slide here uh, is an example that where I used in, in an LMS, the ability to do a video comment, uh, which really only took 30 seconds, I'm going to say, to do. So maybe slightly longer than the text message. So I said, good job. Just add more details next time. You can see in the bottom left. And that media comment is just a recording of me um, saying that same thing. And you can imagine, you know, what's the difference between someone reading a text comment versus someone seeing someone's face speaking with the intonation of, hey, you know, great job out there. Uh, just add a little more details. No, you know, no big deal. Having that intonation and, you know, the more comforting message from, from an instructor or even a TA, who, whoever you can get to do this kind of thing, uh, is going to go miles more than just a text comment. Right. Our, our brains are set up. This is one of the things that I, I loved about my, my biology degree is learning about how the brain reacts to stimulation in the environment. We have whole sections of the brain that are dedicated to seeing faces, to reading emotions, to looking at facial expressions, to hearing intonation in someone's voice. And the more you can use those pieces to to connect with the student, the more engaged they're going to be. So even though it seems like, oh, you know, I'm saying the same thing in this video comment that I'm saying in a text, what's the difference? Well, as I mentioned, the difference is pretty big. So um, doing that type of feedback is can be very valuable. Um, setting up virtual office hours, of course, where, you know, someone 
if, especially if you have an online course. But even if you don't, let's say you have a hybrid course, there may not be time in face-to-face -face sessions and students may not feel as comfortable in face-to-face -to, -face to approach the instructor. So in virtual office hours where students can log in and maybe even have their cameras off, like all of you right now seem to prefer to have the cameras off and that's fine. And that's where people's comfort zone is. You can set up those virtual, people can ask questions via text, however they're comfortable, but they get that interaction, that back and forth that they may not otherwise get in, in, in a traditional setup. So, and that goes for FYE programs too. You know, let's say you're an advisor in an FYE program that has no official meeting times, having that, you know, ability to set up virtual office hours where there's a conversation going on is, is really valuable. Okay. Any questions or comments on, on that? And the virtual, it can be one-on-one, -on -one, the virtual office hours, or it can be an entire class Q&A type thing. So the, there's, and, and anything in between. Okay. So peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, this one, you know, there's been hesitation in the past. I've seen, I've seen interviews with instructors and other administrators saying that, you know, there can be danger with this because as soon as you set up an environment where peers can interact, if anything uh, negative happens, you know, the university could be held liable. And, and to some degree, that's true. But it, if that's going to happen, it can happen even outside of the tools that the university has. So, you know, setting up an environment that it leads to positive interaction between students or even neutral interaction is fine as long as there's learning going on um, is, is, I think, outweighs the the, the negative impact the positive from it is huge. So um, this is this is important. I, that link there, which actually I can I can open up now because I wanted to show it to you and I'll just pull it over into the screen. It's just a does a comparison between different discussion tools. So you may already have some discussion tools set up. You may not, um, but go out there internet and look at the comparisons. What positive certain things have? This one obviously is a little bit dated. Twitter goes by X now. But um, this is still relatively new. It compares them, and there's lots more out there. Your LMS system, if you use it at your school, very often will come with a built-in discussion uh, forum tool. So highly, highly suggest you use that to its advantage. And a lot of people ignore it. I've seen many courses set up where the discussion uh, feature gets completely ignored, and it is highly valuable to do that. And if it can be done within the context of other course content, that is much, much better. I've seen a lot that were set up um to the course as opposed to within the course and having something within the course is much more valuable whoops didn't want to share that <laughs> did that did a question come in i was hearing some beeps there uh, no maybe you're all good <laughs> yeah okay um the types of questions you ask in discussion also should be open-ended rather than you know answer this question with this fact, uh, which would end the discussion. The more open-ended you can have it, the better, because it leads to further discussion. Um, also, try to make it required if possible. I know some people aren't, don't have uh, required programs, other people do, um, but even sometimes just saying it's required, even if the overall FYE program is not required, uh, can have it make a difference. So make it required. Don't make these discussions optional, otherwise nobody will do it. Make them required, but you know don't, don't expect people to write reams of information to write something quick. Uh, and of course, the instructor, sh instructor should contribute to it. If, if the students see that the instructor is bought into it, commenting, and even saying positive things about some people's comments, other students are going to see those positive reinforcements for that other student and want to get on that you know, positive feedback train. So be involved in those discussions as instructors and, and um, as much as you can. I know it's work, but it's work that does pay dividends. I know I can say in courses I've taken and, and my experience with it too, it's great if it can be part of a participation grade or something like that, where it's has a, a kind of a tie in to why as a learner you would participate in it. That seems to be fairly effective. Yeah, I mean, there's so many benefits to it other than, you know, building a sense of community, um, you know, allowing for positive reinforcement, being more engaged with the students directly as an instructor, but also instructors can learn from their students and learn about their students through these discussions that they may not otherwise uh, learn. So those are pretty critical. 
Um, I, I just got through a course, uh, a, a, a post-secondary certificate in data science, and we had a separate forum for discussions, which was helpful, um, but it would have been much better if it was integrated, but it still had a lot of benefit. And I took three courses as part of the program. One, the instructor was very involved with, and I definitely felt more engaged that course. Another course that the instructor was not involved in the discussion forums and didn't feel nearly as engaged. So it, it does have an impact even, even on older adults like, like me. Um, here's an example of setting up a discussion directly in an LMS system. Again, this is Canvas. We don't sell Canvas. We just happen to work with it through, for other reasons. But asking a really simple question of, you know, what's your best trick for something that's helped you in school? So first year student, you know, they may not come armed with a lot of tricks, but they may have one trick that they learned in high school that has worked well for them. It could be something around organization, um, studying, meeting other people. And once they get to share something that's they found successful that gives uh, you know a little bit of a confidence boost to students what they can talk about their strengths things that they've done well so that's a nice little discussion thread but it can open it up and then obviously everybody can learn from that you can even record these types of things and use them in other subsequent years or semesters so things discussion questions like this become really valuable for building a, a, a repository of information you as an instructor can use down the line Now, I'll ask a question though, is, has anyone ever run into problems with discussion tools they wanna share and then maybe how they got around that? Or they have a, a question that can be a good discussion topic for FYE type programs specifically uh, that they have used that has really gotten students to open up and, and participate in that discussion. Um, please either, like you say, you can take yourself off mute at any time, say it out loud or post it in the chat. I will say, Nick, I think we've had a number of people who've had to, who, who've run out of time. Um, so in that way, we, uh, yeah. I okay. Remind them that the recording will be available for tomorrow. Okay, I apologize for that. I'm just about done here. Um, so I will move along quickly um, for the remainder of it. So P um, Peter Action mentioned tools and strategies that can help each group or each, um, each group member be accountable. So very often there's group work that gets created, which is another way to create a sense of community uh, beyond just discussions. And uh, having role-based group work or cross presentation within the group um, can really help with making each member of the group accountable. I know that when you set up group work, uh, very often it can happen where one member of the group takes on the majority of the work and the others kind of coast along which is very unfortunate that it does happen. So there are ways to mitigate that uh, where, you know, roles get assigned to different members of the group and each role is responsible for a certain aspect of the overall project or overall uh, delivery or cross presentation, which allows for cross learning. So person A, for example, researches creates part A, but presents on person's B, P, person B's content and vice versa. So they each become sort of cross responsible and cross learn that way. Um, so that's another technique that can be used to increase engagement. I mentioned okay to fail opportunities. Um, feel free to review this in the recording. I know there's there's a lot of information there, but we mentioned revision assignments before where somewhat this is a, a situation where they've submitted something and they get feedback on it and are allowed to resubmit it based on those revisions. So saying, you know, it's okay when you first handed this in if it's not perfect you can do this again. Same thing with practice quizzes uh, and, and discussion boards can do that as well in, in the way that you can see described there. Progressive projects where, you know, something builds over the year where if, you know, part A of the project, they're already on part F, but they need to revise something on part A, that's fine because it's built up over the course of the semester. And, and of course, peer review workshops where people are able to see each other's and refine and, and revise and, and improve it. So they feel okay in the first release because they only they know only a peer is reviewing it initially. Um, here's another okay to fail uh, opportunity where it's just a simple little online activity where they can test themselves, get immediate feedback on whether they've done everything correctly. It's a matching activity um, built into a, a content piece that we deliver here at Human Resources. 
but it's it's a, like a practice quiz essentially. Um, seeing a clear view of progress. This is the, the last bullet point, and then the overall strategy is increasing engagement. Um, seeing everything in one place in a learning management system in a dashboard is ideal. They know where they've been. They know what they have left to do. Uh, I know sometimes in modern day with all these different online tools we have out there, sometimes we're pointing students in different places, say, okay, for this element, you're going to go over here. For this element, you go over here. And sometimes that gets you the best sources, but it's really important to try to aggregate the connection of those in one place. If, if everything is sort of scattered, it becomes frustrating for the student and they're going to drop engagement. If you can aggregate everything in one place, even if it's a series of links, but something gets tracked back there, that's um, going to help. Gamification elements, as I mentioned before, it's just scoring points as they go along. And, and of course, progress reports. This can be automated. So very often LMS will have a built-in ability to send out a progress report at the end of each week saying, hey, here's what you know what was due this week. Here's what you accomplished. Good job. And it's nice to see that come in as, as a learner to know that, oh, I, you know, there's the work I've done. I've been reminded of the work I've done, but also where I have to go. Um, of course, that thing can be tied to learning outcomes where you're looking at the progress of where I've been versus where I am now. So this is an example of a tool that we deliver at Human Resources that measures how well the learning outcomes are before they go through the content. That would be the green check marks you see there. So in some cases, a student has you know, very little accomplishment around the learning outcome. But by the end of it, the blue check marks, they've indicated they have actually learned those learning outcomes. They have accomplished those learning outcomes. And when they see this, they say, oh, yeah, I have actually come pretty far. That's reassuring. And that increases engagement in subsequent um, aspects of a course or FYE program. So seeing their own growth is important to them. And this can be, this is something obviously that's useful for faculty as well as students. So what tools can help? I know we're almost out of time. Um, like I said, pick one place to aggregate everything. This is a, a, a neat website that um, you can go to. It's called Edu App Center and shows you all kinds of apps that can integrate with various LMS systems. Open LTI, by the way, is a standard that most LMS systems use. It's just like a you can kind of think of it as a type of a language that LMS systems use. So if something is LTI compatible, um, it usually can integrate with your LMS system. And that's what these things are. So there's a huge number. See, I can scroll through here, you know, dozens, perhaps, you know, well over 100 and all of these. So um, if you're wanting to do something and you need a tool to help you with the engagement around it, to, you know, this is a good place to look for those. So um, definitely recommend that. I'll keep going to the wrong screen. Apologize. Use and learn your LMS. Uh, that, that's another big takeaway here. Your, your LMS system is most educators and faculty I've seen don't take advantage of all the tools in LMS. It's really advantageous for you to do it. Here's an example of an LMS that we've set up where you know you, you set up uh, all the different pieces of it aggregated. You get a to-do list. They can see a course calendar. Uh, they get an inbox of messages. They can see their history. There's um, lots that can be done within the LMS system to really help. And like I said, the, its biggest advantage is that it's an aggregator of other tools that you can integrate with it. Um, when it comes to online content, obviously you're looking for something varied and interactive. Uh, the four bullets see there, this is probably something you've seen before, but just to reiterate it, you definitely want to mix text, images, and video. Auto scoring certain quizzes, especially practice quizzes is important. They get that immediate feedback. So anything with that built in is great. The ability to do reflection or open-ended writing so it's not just quizzes on built-in discussion because that can be really revealing to the instructor. And it, if it forces a, a deeper level of thinking than uh, the objectively measured items you would see in, in your standard, in your traditional quizzes. Of course, highlighted note-taking, that is available in online environments now, just like it was in, in your paper copy textbooks. So look for things like that because it does engage the students more. Um, I'll just mention that Coloscope is a content product that uh, we at Human Resources provide, and it does some of those things fairly well. I'm just going to flip quickly through this. We're not here to do a big sales pitch, 
but I just wanted to mention some of the things like this, you see all the different things here from videos, to interactive practice questions, uh, which are there reflective. The practice tests that I've mentioned before, the reflection on the right, uh, highlighting and annotating is built into it. Um, so something like that where they can see notes. And um, assessment, self-assessment is, is built into it as well. So um, I think we're just about out of time. This is tracking for educators so you can see it. it makes your job a little bit easier because it's tracking all in one place. And this is uh, integrated with the LMS. So you're actually seeing content come from um, an online tool like College Scope integrated through that LTI system I mentioned earlier in delivering the grades, assessment results, um, journals, all those types of things are thrown back into the LMS. And so it's all aggregated in one place, which is always a good thing. 